Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hidden growth opportunities throughout online business. For those familiar and new to the podcast, I'm Sarah. And a quick announcement for everyone for today and moving forward for a while, the podcast is going to be hosted by just me. We're getting into conference season and Brandon is off making all the conferences we're joining in on go over smoothly. I'll miss having him on the show with me, but I know he's out there creating a great conference experience for our team and conference goers, so I can't be but so sad. So we'll get into what's going on with today's episode now that we're through some quick announcements. In this episode, we have SEO expert Shauna Newman. She's the founder of Skip Blast, a home for in-depth courses on creating digital authority with niche sites, as well as data-driven case studies and content on building and flipping sites. At any given time, Shauna has a full portfolio of niche sites that she's built entirely from scratch or acquired for a flip, and she lives entirely off the income they create. Today, we get into winning strategies that Shauna has found over the years. We talk about when to buy, when to build, what to look for when building a site with an expired domain, and the scaling techniques Shauna has found that really work. We even break down what popular SEO advice is simply bad advice in the industry and what other avenues you should consider instead. I don't want to give away too much just yet, so let's dig into the interview and see what Shauna has to share. And stay tuned at the end of the episode where I'll provide some extra insight by answering some common questions online business builders have. So let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. Really excited to have Shauna Newman on with us today. So Shauna, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Good for you to be here. So to kick things off, tell me where you are in the world right now. Uh, Yeah, I'm currently living in Vegas and staying inside, avoiding the heat with as much air conditioning as possible. Yeah, I am definitely feeling free there. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Croatian heat wave is not doing so hot either, or it's literally hot. So (laughs) staying inside with my one AC unit here, Ilya. (laughs) So, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're going to already know who you are and be familiar with you. But for those who don't know you, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, your entrepreneurial journey and what that looks like today? Uh, Yeah. So I'm basically like a senior citizen in the industry, I guess, because I've been doing some form of SEO and niche sites since about 2003. When I started, the craze was made for AdSense sites. Since then, I've kind of evolved into doing more niche sites, focusing on Amazon affiliates. And today I'm doing kind of like a hybrid type of site where I'm doing, you know, affiliate things other than Amazon, as well as display ads. And I really got serious in this industry back in 2008 after the recession when I lost a job. And I would say it took about two years after that before I started seeing real success. Awesome. Well, you know, you kind of kicked it off saying that you'd been in the industry for a while. You know, I was wondering, like, SEO isn't necessarily easy. Having online sites and dealing with all sorts of changes can Mm -hmm. be tough sometimes. So what is it about SEO that really resonates with you and and makes you kind of want to stick through all of those obstacles? Yeah, I mean, it really does keep you on your toes and you have to always be ready to pivot into what's working now opposed to what was working. And I mean, that's kind of like a puzzle. And so I guess I'm kind of a nerd like that. I really like the puzzle aspect of SEO and putting all the pieces together, seeing what fits, what doesn't and what really works and what doesn't. That's awesome. Yeah. No, it's a lot of fun to have SEOs on and to pick their brains. And it does seem like you really need to have that almost like that data analytical approach. Right, and, right, yeah, a yeah. little bit of an artistry too, right? Because yeah, it's, yeah. it's not a perfect science. Um, exactly. So, yeah. So I understand that you have a portfolio and you kind of mm-hmm. always have had a portfolio of sites. I was wondering if you, you know, feel willing to share, what does your portfolio look like today? So right now, I think I've got 17 active sites in a variety of niches, and they're all kind of like in a variety of like profitability. So my most profitable site right now is my oldest site, and it's making around six grand a month. And then, of course, on the other end, I have new sites that I've started recently that are obviously not making anything. And then in addition to those, I have eight test sites 
Some of those are making money, some aren't. Money making isn't really the objective with those. I just kind of like to test like new ideas that I have to see what's going on with those sites. That's awesome. I was wondering, I mean, do you have like a particular balance for your sites or goal in mind when you build out your portfolio? I mean, it sounds like you've got, you know, groups of tests and bigger earners and new sites, but do you have a kind of makeup for that and a, a game plan? I'm kind of messy about it because while I used to focus mostly on things that I knew would make money, so kind of like studying auctions of what has sold and stuff like that in marketplaces. But these days I'm kind of like, oh, that sounds interesting. Or, oh, I'd like to learn about that. Like I'm starting a skateboard site right now and I don't know anything about skateboarding, but you know, I've been seeing it on the Olympics and it's kind of interesting. So I'm like, oh, that'll be fun for me to do for a while and just kind of learn about skateboarding, even though I don't really want to skateboard. So that's kind of like my approach. It's just like, whatever kind of strikes me as interesting at the time. That's amazing. So, I mean, it sounds like you're doing this all on your own or do you have a team with you? It's all on my own. I I recently recruited my wife into helping me. She is a filmmaker and an author. So she, she's not really interested in doing SEO and stuff like that. And one of my sites started really taking off and I was like, do you want to help me with this or should I just outsource it to some freelancers? And she's like, okay, that could be interesting for me. So, so I've kind of Got her working on more than one site. She didn't really intend to do it though. (laughs) Awesome. I mean, how do you start from scratch on so many sites? I feel like I don't see that very often where, you know, an SEO is actually building every single site within their portfolio or willing to start things from scratch. Like that takes a lot of guts to say, I'm interested. I'm going to build a site on that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, like my background is my undergrad is in journalism and English. So I write a lot of my own content, which I don't think most people do. Mm. It's often just faster for me to do it myself. So I start out writing my own content. I'll do like a big content sprint whenever I start a new site to get up like maybe 50 posts or so. And then I've kind of moved that site to the side just to work on the next one and kind of let that first one marinate. But I like to work on a quarterly basis. So say every quarter, I'll have like up to five established sites that I focus on. And I'll start some new sites during that time as well. And then the next quarter, I'll rotate out five more established sites that I work on. So that's kind of just the way I work through it. Wow. That's... I'm feeling very uh, underaccomplished right now. <laughs> Good. No, that's that's amazing. Especially being able to sort of max out and really hit that, you know, I'm going to do 50 pieces of content myself. Like that's yeah. that's no small feat. And clearly a lot of, like a lot of people have to source that out because they just simply can't, right. they don't have the writing chops, you know? Well, I think it's easier too if you start out focusing on informational content simply because one, there's not much competition compared to affiliate focused content, but also the content link that you need to actually rank is often a lot shorter. So it's easier to get 50 pieces of informational content compared to say 50 buying guides. When you're first starting out, I understand that, you know, you were saying earlier that you've got some sites that they're brand new and they're not making money yet. Do you Mm -hmm. tend to have a kind of benchmark in mind of when you start to see money from those new sites? You mean in terms of like a timeline? Yeah, sorry, timeline. When I'm going into new niches, I don't really know what to expect. In generally speaking, I kind of like like to think about making $1,000 a month from a site. And most niches, you can do that in 12 to 18 months if you're kind of like working on it slowly, kind of like how I rotate things on a quarterly basis. Whereas when I used to just have fewer sites to focus on, you could do that in 12 months or less. So basically, if if I'm working on it through my quarterly rotation, I expect it to be making $1,000 somewhere between 12 to 18 months. Okay, pretty cool. Yeah, Yeah, no, I I understand that everybody's got, it's a different sort of uh, track record and what you can expect. And sometimes it goes up faster, sometimes it doesn't. I'm curious, you know, do you have like a personal formula for when to buy and when to exit within your portfolio? When I'm buying sites, basically what I really like to look for are sites that are around five grand or under that someone has started and they have a really good foundation, but it hasn't really taken off yet. I think those are the best undervalued sites. And when I do that, I'm looking for things where I can buy a site, move it to an existing site of mine as like an entirely new content cluster for that site. In terms of when I'm flipping sites, I don't really have a number in mind. Usually once I start working on it and seeing what kind of traffic I'm getting, what kind of monetization options I have and what kind of money those bring in, then I can say, oh, well, you know, I think this has the ceiling of say 25,000, but I'd like to exit at 10,000 or something like that. 
Okay. Well, that makes sense. I mean, it sounds like obviously you've got loads of experience mm-hmm. in flipping. You know, I like how you said you're looking for opportunities under, you know, 5K and people that just haven't been able to really grow it to the next level. But, you know, would you say that there's pillars to website flipping that you found to really held up over the years? Or, you know, in what ways have you seen website flipping change over time? I think the one constant is that you really need a clean site. So like, you know, I don't buy sites with questionable links or if they've got, say, 100% of the links are the same type. So if it was all blog comments, you know, I want to see like some diversity in links. And links in general also is another thing that has always been a, you know, constant in flipping sites. But what we've seen evolve is the type of links that are accepted, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was first into PBNs, there wasn't a lot known about them. So it was easy to flip sites with PBNs and then spend certain niche pursuits, got that big penalty on his sites. And so then multiples drop for sites with PBNs and things like that. I think the two things that most people probably notice that have changed with flipping is the multiples, of course, because I know my first site I flipped with Empire Flippers, I got a 20x. And you know, and now you guys are posting things up on the marketplace that are 45 and 50x. I think we're also seeing a big evolution in terms of monetization insights and what buyers are looking for. I think we're seeing these days, and you can tell me if you agree or not, less of a focus on Amazon affiliate sites and general affiliate sites and more of a focus on both diversity and display ads, I feel like is really where the trend is going. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I guess to your point about rising multiples, I mean, we're certainly seeing that across the board as the industry becomes more mature. And then, you know, one thing that we've been talking about a lot recently is there's a good chance that content becomes a future gold rush in the same way that FBA, you know, all of a sudden matured really fast and billions of capital started flooding in, Mm -hmm. you know, those aggregators are needing to stay competitive and they're looking at content as an next growth avenue. And not to mention, then there's also content focused aggregators coming in and it's starting to buy. So yeah, it's been an interesting time. Like the, the, you know, the multiples, it's just kind of a reflection of that buyer appetite and the the maturing of the industry. And then to your point on site diversification, Mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, it's really been interesting in the, the couple of years that I've been in Empire Flippers too. You know, as you know, you watch things change within Mm -hmm. certain affiliate spheres or Amazon associates and you definitely to watch people really struggle with the commission cuts and going, okay, I got to, I got to start (laughs) thinking, maybe, maybe I should have uh, thought about diversification. (laughs) (laughs) So actually having to counteract that and being able to think ahead, I suppose, for the future, Mm -hmm. it's certainly coming to play, you know, in the buyer sphere. And you're probably seeing that amongst the community itself, right? Right. Yeah. Like I'm in a lot of Facebook groups too, where SEOs are buying up like small sites. And I've been noticing a trend in the last 12 months of people saying, I'm looking to buy sites, but I don't want any Amazon sites. I want sites I can monetize by display ads. And so I I feel like there aren't enough people really paying attention to that evolution in the industry. And we still have too many people really focusing on just making Amazon affiliate sites. So I'm hoping everyone catches up to that soon. Mm, Okay. And so, I mean, it sounds like that might be, you know, an avenue that you're pursuing for the future is really honing in on that a bit more. Yeah. um, I've always been pretty big on income diversification on my sites. I know a lot of people know that I had a big thing with Amazon back in, I guess it was 2015, where they had closed an account of mine for reasons that were false. And we actually took them to court here in in Las Vegas and sued them and won the money that they owed us that they were trying to steal. So ever since then, I've been really big on making sure that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's really interesting to hear your perspective because, of course, the flip side of that coin is you have enough, we talk to enough, say, FBA sellers or just other business owners who work with Amazon who know what it's like to let's just say, not get treated well. By yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, yeah, certainly really interesting with people on the e-com side and just sort of like the tangents they'll go on when they just start talking about all the different ways they have to navigate these changes or start looking at Amazon as a competitor. And mm-hmm. I mean, of course, we know it's a great business model when you're partnering with Amazon in certain businesses. But yeah, having like the fine tooth comb with that relationship, <laughs> <laughs> as you, you very yeah. well know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I always tell people when you're starting a new site, I think it really only benefits you to really explore all of the biggest sites in that niche to see how they're monetizing and then come up with a list of 100% of the ways you can monetize your site, even if you don't intend on ever you know, adding on a, 
a Shopify store to it or anything like that, just so you know the true potential. So if something does go crazy with Amazon or another affiliate or even display ads, you have somewhere to pivot to. Mm. Well, it, it kind of relates to one of the questions I had for you down the road. I mean, would you say there's you know more hidden growth opportunities you know, within SEO or niche site building that most people miss. So, you know, even if it's they're making that master list of ways to monetize, what would you say are like the things that people should be adding to their list, but they tend to not think of? Well, I mean, obviously income diversification, I think that people, they kind of get comfortable. Like, you know, you add your Amazon affiliates links, you add maybe Mediavine and you get really comfortable with that income coming in and you're leaving a lot on the table, you know, because you can make, you know, eBooks, you can make courses, you can, you know, I've seen people who have sites focus on things like tarot card readings and they actually sell readings. So I think people get stuck in that rut because they get too comfortable and they're not really focusing on that. I think another thing that people really miss is a great way to grow your sites is learning copywriting, you know, picking up books like The Psychology of Persuasion, learning things like that. You know, it's kind of like I know Greg you know, with Empire Flippers there, he's always talking about thinking about your sites like a media company. And I think that's such great advice for people who are getting into this industry new. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Greg would be super thrilled. <laughs> 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 but, you know, it makes me think I, I was looking through, you know, your website and some of your stuff and you had this one big, I guess it wasn't a case study, but just writing about your experience and that you didn't have a good experience with a particular freelance writing agency and right. what that was like. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting because we hear that a lot with the people that come on our shows, you know, that have content sites. It's that eternal struggle of, am I good enough to do this myself? Or right. is the outsource work going to be good enough to hold up? And I think a lot of people go, well, the point of me having this site is for passive income. You know, Why mm -hmm. would I be working in the business and doing the writing? I'm just going to outsource this. And I think by doing that sometimes and just saying, here's some writing to this freelancer, you're not really thinking about that media empire strategy. You're not really thinking right. about those growth opportunities and ways that you could be incorporating persuasion, like you mentioned. It's right. how could I actually make this better? Well, and I think for a lot of people, like the big dream is to make your site and sell it to like a big brand or media company. And a great example of this is Morton, who has the YouTube channel Passive Income Geek. He has that big site that's public, godownsize.com. And he's recently mentioned that there's a big company in the industry who's going to buy that from him for over a million dollars. I know he's written a lot of the content himself for that site. And so I think people kind of, they're trying to take shortcuts with outsourcing and just saying, well, it's good enough because everyone else is doing it good enough. And they're not really seeing the big picture of possibility here. Mm. Oh, that's just such a great point. Yeah. It's, we were just talking about that within our team and, you know, it's those media companies that you almost want to shoot for the stars, right? You want exactly. to be good yes. enough to get them to want to look to you because they are. When, mm -hmm. I, when I mentioned content aggregators, they're basically a half step away from that. You know, they might not be like you're looking at a landing page for a particular PE group, but I mean, those large media presences, they are doing those roll ups and they are looking for great content opportunities to bolt on to what they already have existing. So, you know, how do you be good enough to get in front of them? I mean, you're going to have to really start to branch out, raise a bar for your content. And yeah, right. I, I th think it's a great point you mentioned, like, there's nothing wrong with having a site and kind of leaving the bar there and saying, it makes me some money, that's it. But mm -hmm. when push comes to shove and Amazon cuts your commission or all of a sudden your traffic takes a huge hit, you got to be better than that, right? Yeah. And like you said, people view it as passive income. And I think that if they really want that big success like Morton is experiencing, then you have to reframe your mindset a little bit. And it's not just passive income you can get. You can really, like you said, you can shoot for the stars. Mm. Well, I guess, you know, on that point, we're talking about scaling. I wanted to pick your brain on a couple different growth avenues. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, you know, when it comes to scaling a site and trying to pick a growth avenue, you know, when do you know it's best to prioritize, let's say, start with content over links? You know, it's funny that you asked that because if you had asked me that like maybe a year ago, I would have said links, but I just mm -hmm. finished a year long case study where I took an established site that I had been sending links and content to. And then I spent an entire year where I just stopped link building completely and put all of my efforts towards content. So I ended up spending almost $10,000 during those 12 months on content. And that boosted the site's revenue by $2,500 a month, which obviously at a 40X is $100,000. And when you compare that to the previous year where I was doing links and content, the income only increased $900 a month, which would be you know like $36,000. So definitely content all the way for me. 
Amazing. Yeah. It's really interesting. I tend to hear like mm, almost 50-50 take. I, I hear enough people come on the show and really – you know, loud content as the way to go. But I think it's really interesting. It, maybe you tell me because you're in the SEO space. Mm-hmm. You know, do a lot of SEOs go, the way that I'm going to work my way up with my sites is, you know, I'm going through links. I'm going through all the different SEO tactics versus just kind of like really digging in and trying to get that nuance to their content to grow their sites. I feel like that is a great beginner mindset. And then I think once you are kind of deep in the trenches here and you get more experience, I think. Like for me, what I like to do since I'm a one woman show for the most part is what can I do that gives me the most ROI without taking a ton of my time? And right now, what I think is working the best is finding an age domain that has great links already. So you start out just with all your links that you need, and then you just really hit it hard with content. So you don't have to spend any money on the links. It's basically like a shortcut, right? So you don't do any link building. You just focus on content, which is going to give you even more traffic, I think, than focusing on the links just themselves. And you're going to be making income sooner. However, like I said, I don't think that's a good strategy for someone who's new to doing this, because I feel like you kind of, you do need to get in the trenches and go through doing it all your, you know, separately and seeing like how it works basically. Mm. Yeah. I'm excited to talk to you about age domains and expiring. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I'll get there in a minute (laughs) before I just absolutely slam you with this question. But okay, so first off, I did want to talk about because we were obviously discussing ads a lot in this Mm -hmm. episode. So when is it best to prioritize adding ads and other monetizations? I think I'm probably kind of more of an anomaly in this industry where I don't really see the sense in waiting to monetize. I know that a lot of people are like, oh, I wait until I get X number of posts live or until X amount of traffic. I start monetizing as soon as possible. Mm. Obviously, you can't get approved for AdSense with you know just one post or anything like that. Like I have a new site that has 35 posts on it right now, and I applied for AdSense when it had only 20 posts, and they told me, no, my site was too thin. I got 35 up, applied again, and got approved. So I don't know why you would leave money on the table, like I said. So I, mm. I usually start with AdSense first. But if I've got content that, you know, needs an Amazon link or an REI link or a Wayfair link or whatever, I'll add that on day one if I need to, because like I said, I don't see the sense in waiting. And then you're just creating more work for yourself if you have to go back in later to add those links. So yeah, that's an interesting take. You know, I guess I haven't spoken to too many people that have waited, but odds are, you know, if you've ended up on this podcast, you're enough of an expert where it's like, (laughs) you you know, go ahead and start monetizing early on. But I I like that. I think that's great advice. There's enough people listening who are just starting out and probably got that advice from someone else and going, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) I need to rethink the strategy. Well, how about building an email list? So what does that look like for you? And, And when's the best time to prioritize that? I usually like to wait until I'm seeing a decent amount of traffic, like at least 10,000 monthly sessions for that. I've been testing that out a lot in the past year or so, and I found that the easiest way to get people on that list is to offer them something like a checklist. So like, I don't know if you're starting a podcast, maybe you were offering a free list of everything you needed to get started to get people on your mailing list or something like that. But I've been testing how often you should send people emails and if you get better ROI and stuff like that. And I don't have any real solid conclusions yet, but it does seem that like if you send them something weekly, then they won't drop off your list and you kind of get a better result so far. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that. It's I love being able to talk to people about email because I feel like, and we talk about this a lot and we're you know, telling people, you know, scale your media empire. I think one piece of that puzzle is obviously building that email list. It's a really right. important form of traffic if you can get it right. Mm-hmm. But I think there's generally a fear when doing that. And you hit the nail right. on the head where people are too afraid to talk to them too often or too little. And what's the secret sauce? And, you know, everyone seems to have a different perspective, but it sounds like the course of people are like, you know, it's actually better to talk to them more often, maybe even a little bit more often than you might be comfortable with at first because you're too afraid of scaring them off. But have that connection, make it happen and make sure to get in front of them. Otherwise, your email list isn't going to be doing anything for you. Right. Yeah. I I think you have to get them like used to seeing you basically is what it is. Yeah. A hundred percent. Well, cool. I mean, so I guess relating back to one of your earlier points, I guess to set this up, when I first joined Empire Flippers and I was learning about these listings and coming through and and seeing the vetting tickets and stuff. Obviously one thing I kept coming across was expired domains. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I was trying to understand 
what made a good expired domain. And when I, when I went to go search for it myself and I did it like a couple different times, I found such a myriad of answers and <laughs> they were fluffy and unclear. Right. And some were like, it's good, you know, just you know, <laughs> very like unconfident. And then, you know, others were saying, oh my God, absolutely do not do this. If you know, X, Y, and Z, but it still felt fluffy on their end. They couldn't spell out why. And it wasn't until I'd come across a listing on our marketplace and it was a content site and they exited for, you know, seven figures and they'd done it so fast. And working on their listing and looking at their vetting ticket, they bought an amazing expired domain and speaking to that seller, they're like, yeah, it's why I was able to do what I did. I just found the right opportunity. I jumped on it, devoted my whole life to it for, yeah, I think like a year and a half, was mm-hmm. able to exit for seven figures, which is are nuts. <laughs> but I find that no one seems to know the secret sauce. So I'm really curious <laughs> to know, how did you develop a successful system to acquire aged and expired domains? Well, I don't know if most people go through the kind of process that I did, but I spent like... <laughs> $20,000 testing a variety of domains that were mostly failures over the course of probably two years. You know, I was testing like, what happens if I just put this up immediately and start putting buying guides on it? What happens if I redirect it immediately to existing sites? What happens if I put up a dummy site for three months and then redirect it? So like I tested a lot of different things before I figured out what was the best ROI for me, basically. And I also feel like there's a lot of people using the terms age domains and expired domains interchangeably. And, mm-hmm. and I think that there's actually one distinct difference in them, which is an age domain has never been dropped, whereas an expired domain has been dropped. And so there's some school of thought that if it has been dropped, then the links that it, we're pointing at it aren't going to be as powerful or you'll be put back in the sandbox. I've had both experiences, so I don't really know that there's a rule of thumb with the expired domains. But just having one of those experiences is enough for me to focus exclusively on the age domains that have never been dropped. Mm. So for me, I buy them either from ODYS or SERP names. Based on my experience, and I don't know if this is the way that they work or not from everyone else, or if it was just like dumb luck for me, SERP names had more domains that had actually been dropped compared to ODYS. And I don't know if you guys interviewed them or whatever, but you can confirm that for me or not. So what I like to do is I like to find something that has a lot of niche relevant domains pointed at the age domain. Generally, I like to see at least 150 domains pointing at that, referring domains pointed at it, because in my experience of all that testing that I did, those are the ones that perform the best for me. And when I'm looking through those marketplaces for those age domains, what I will do is I'll actually get on a piece of paper, go through the backlink profile and like, okay, this, here's one that was a travel niche. Here's one that was a general news niche pointing at it. You know, here's one that was just a random blog pointing at it so that I can get a, basically a, a, see the ratio of niche relevant versus not niche relevant. And that's really it. And, you know, I don't really focus on anything other than do they have at least 150 referring domains pointed at it? Has it never been dropped? And are those referring domains mostly niche relevant? Excellent. I guess I got fixated on something you were talking about earlier okay. when you were, but you're testing those sites and picking them up and you know, there's sort of different things you're trying out. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that you found resulted in in failure the most when you were implementing some of those tests? So I had a lot of failures with the domains that had been dropped. I had a lot of failures with the domains that did not have niche relevant backlink profiles. So I bought some that had zero niche relevance domains pointed at them based on what I wanted to do. And then I found some that only had a very limited number of niche relevant referring domains. In my experience, those didn't really, neither of those really perform very well. I also tested completely changing the niche for my fresh, you know, like my new content compared to the, what the backlink profile looked like. And that was a complete bust for me as well. Okay. No, it's interesting. You know, without enough people on, like I don't really get to talk to a lot of people who say that they actually implemented this system and have it work, mm-hmm. but clearly you've invested. I mean, dropping 20K on testing is no small investment uh, <laughs> yeah. to, to get this right. So, but I mean, how much of your portfolio now would you say is built on either aged or expired domains? So I have my project Tartarus case study site that's on an ODYS domain. And then I have three existing sites where I've got 301 redirects that are the aged domains. And then I have, let's see, one, two, actually seven of my eight current test sites are age domains. Wow. 
Okay. Yeah. So that it sounds like, has that kind of revolutionized how you flip sites? And this seems to be more of like a growing theme in your portfolio. Well, I actually, I don't think I've actually flipped any of the ones with any of the age domains yet because I've just been holding on to them. Okay. The Project Charterous site that I'm working on, though, I do intend to flip mostly because it's not really a niche I'm interested in. I just basically wanted to test it and do a case study and it took off. So Awesome. Yeah. I saw on your site that I think you said for this past year that you had been kind of holding in your portfolio and you hadn't really exited recently, correct? Right. Yeah. I have a few sites that I've kind of been finessing all this year that I intend to sell at the end of this year. Amazing. Okay. So just kind of looking for the the right time. Yeah. Like basically my sweet spot has always been anywhere between 500 to 1500 monthly income. That's when I flip. So what I've been doing this past year or so, is just kind of holding onto them longer so I can aim for like, you know, two to 5,000 monthly income before I flip. Okay. Awesome. But basically just bigger, bigger exits is all it is. Exactly. Like you said earlier with the, the rising multiples, why not, you know, hold yeah, on to exactly, it a little bit longer exactly. and be able to get yeah. that big exit. Totally. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about like different growth avenues and kind of hinted to, uh, yeah, what it, what could potentially go wrong? Um, <laughs> we haven't really pointed our finger a lot at Google yet, so it's time right. to <laughs> it's time to point and wave at uh, at Google. I was wondering, what advice would you give to someone who just got hit by an algorithm update in order to recoup losses and bounce back? Well, the first thing would be wait. I think most people have seen that usually when Google does an update within a couple of weeks, they kind of reverse parts of it. So. I would definitely wait at least two weeks before taking any drastic actions. And then I would just do a full like site audit, you know, cover everything. You know, do I have any thin pages? Do I have pages that need updated? Look to see if anyone has ripped off your content on scraper sites. So maybe you're getting basically demoted because maybe Google thinks you plagiarized somebody, something like that. You know, see if you've lost a lot of links that you used to have pointing at your site, things like that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think it's too easy to panic and then start right. messing and then yes. <laughs> you do more damage. Is there ever kind of like a a too long, I suppose on the other side of that, that, you know, if you got hit, is it two weeks in, okay, it's good to start working on it? Or, you know, is it because two months in after the algorithm hit has been laid out on your site, that's almost too late to start making changes. I, I don't know. Maybe it's too situational, but I'm just curious. I don't know that there really is a too long. No. So for me, since I have such a large portfolio, I had a site that got hit. I think it was one of the updates last year. And the site that got hit was not in my quarterly group of sites to work on. So I waited like two months before I was going to work on it. And it rebounded on its own in the next update. So if somebody has more than one site and their main earner isn't the one that got hit, it may benefit you just to do nothing until the next update. Mm, okay. No, I, I like that. I, I'm sure people who had gotten hit in the recent updates are listening to this, like hopefully. Yeah. Hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know a lot of people that only have one site, so I'm sure that panic is real. So like I said, just doing a full audit is the best option for that. Yeah. I love that. I think that's great advice. What about link building? You know, how do you approach link building in your portfolio? And what have you found to lead to the greatest growth for your sites? So I actually hate link building, even though I've done a lot of it in <laughs> my time doing SEO. Several years ago, I did a test on internal links to determine if I could boost a site that had fallen just with internal linking, because I didn't want to spend any money on links at the time. And my findings then in the niche that I was in was that Five internal links was with the same value as three external links. So ever since I discovered that in that niche, I've been really big on doing internal linking. And I've found that if you're really good with your internal linking, then you don't need as many actual backlinks. So with that in mind, the next thing that I focus on is Harrow, just because you can do it yourself for free and you can get amazing links that people can't replicate. And then if I'm in a niche where I need more links than that, then I'll do guest posts. Just thinking about that, you know, as you're talking about the different link building strategies, you know, I know Harrow is great, but I know Harrow is also time consuming. Right. And I know that you've got so many sites you're working on, you're doing it mm -hmm. quarterly. I mean, I'm just curious, like how much time are you spending in a day working on these sites? Not as much as you would think. Um, back, say, like, I don't know, like in 2012, 2014, I was easily working 12 and 16 hour days some days, you know, mm. but these days... Basically, I'm so like used to doing the same things day in, day out with these sites that I would say I work 
four to five hours a day on my sites, if that. And I take two days off a week at least. And then like I usually take all of December off. And like this year I took all of December and all of January off. So Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> Fair play to you to go from, you know, the cubicle life and working long hours yeah. to yeah, being able to I mean 17 sites and you're only working that much. Like that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I think it just I have a lot of lists, I'll say. So you have to be really organized and really focused. Mm. No, that's fair. That's I guess you have to be <laughs> like, I mean, the sites are kind of like children, I suppose. It's just like <laughs> yeah. a lot of children to manage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's cool. So I'm looking forward to asking you this one. As you know, there's a lot of well-known SEO advice in the space. <laughs> and I, I'm kind of curious if there's anything you'd maybe call bullshit on. Like what is out there that's in the space that's maybe false or damaging? And what would be your counter to that common advice or an approach? The first things that come to mind, we've actually already talked about, which is that you need to hold off on monetization and that you need to drip out your content. There seems to be some kind of big misconception that if you don't drip out your content when it's a new site, then Google won't crawl your site, right? Mm. I'm not really sure where that came from, but it's crazy. Bad rumors have to be born somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> and they have to who are around. these people? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, The people who are probably selling a course on that advice. Uh, Probably, right? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. No, that's cool. I I like to be able to sort of counter some of that and bring the right experts in because I'm sure as somebody who runs through a million tests and you know your stuff, it's got to be so frustrating to see other people just touting you know, success that might not be there or, and especially on advice that doesn't even work. (laughs) That's got to be a hard one. Yeah, like what's that thing? Like the loudest monkey in the room gets the attention or whatever. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly it. So, kind of wrapping up here, do you have an idea of what the future of building niche sites might look like? And what do you think it's going to take to stay ahead? I think we're actually going to see it transform more into what Greg has been talking about, where people are building these mega sites with, you know, multiple traffic streams, multiple revenue streams that are kind of like their own little, like, many media empires. Amazing. I love that. And Greg, yeah, he's just going to be like, just so happy he woke up today. He's like, someone's going to tell me I'm right today. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> right? Sean and Newman. <laughs> yeah, he's a fun guy. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think he's spot on. I mean, there's a guy who's an authority hacker pro. I can't think of his name. It's Michael something, but he's like super focused on doing that. And I actually remember seeing him talking about it before Greg ever was talking about it. And he's got these mega sites that bring in six figures a month each. So it's wow. it's definitely, I think, where we're going to see things go. I just I just don't know how long it's going to take us to get there, really. Mm. Yeah, I understand. Asking people about the future in something like online business, it doesn't matter the monetization, is like, I mean, geez, look at the past year that we had. How can we yeah. possibly look ahead? But yeah. worth knowing. And I think that's really, really great advice. And it kind of relates back to that central point of, raise a bar on your entire process. You know, if you really want to make it in the industry, don't approach your site as something you think is going to be passive and you're going to do it the way the rest of the industry is doing it. You do have to think a little bit bigger than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so this just about wraps things up. We tend to close things out with a rapid fire section, if you're cool with that. Mm -hmm. So first off, best hidden growth opportunities for any SEO. I think I'll have to go with the learning copywriting type of stuff. I'm actually, sometime last year, I enrolled in the copy hackers, copy school, you know, and I've read things like cash advertising and things like that and psychology of persuasion. And I think since we're trying to sell to people and actually entice people to stay on our sites and revisit it, that is the number one thing that is the hidden growth opportunity that no one's really focusing on. Excellent. What about tools or resources that can help online business owners grow their business? I would say maybe the Authority Hacker blog and their podcast, they give a lot of good information. I don't agree with 100% of the things that they share, but for the most part, I think that they're a good place to start for people. I'm also a big fan of Mushfeek over at the website Flip. He publishes a newsletter about the industry and kind of like gives his takes on growing sites and things like that. And I feel like he's one of the people who's delivering a lot of value in this industry right now. He's not getting much attention, although more people are starting to notice him. And something that may come out of left field here, Google Trends. I use it a lot when I'm planning my content calendars for my sites and investigating new niches. And I don't think it gets kind of propped up as much as it should by SEOs. Yeah, no, that's great. That's awesome insight. 
So final question here. What has been your funniest moment working as an online entrepreneur? You know, I think there's probably more stressful moments than funny moments in this industry. I did have a site once where I was doing it as a male persona and I got the got an email to do a podcast for dads because I thought I was a dude. So that was oh, pretty no. funny. Um, <laughs> I also have a site right now that's ranking for butt chafing, which is kind of humorous. <laughs> do you get any podcast invites for that one? Not yet, but who knows? Maybe. <laughs> It's like, I haven't made it as an SEO until I get invited for a podcast about butt shaving. I think that's, that's so you know, far. I did uh, Craig Campbell's podcast, I think it was earlier this year, and we were talking about niches and he hit me with anal bleaching just out of the blue as a niche. And oh my that gosh. was pretty jarring. <laughs> I, I think it's so funny because when we ask people this question on the podcast, it almost is like in the realm of that territory, especially right. when you're working with products online, yeah. and it's, it tends to be the, I wrote about X and I made money on, right. you know, yeah. it was yeah. shocking. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's like a, an undercover lesson in online business. You're going to be exposed to and possibly building a site in some shocking stuff. So right. Yeah, get ready. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, sh- I realized I should actually clarify since I said earlier that I only made sites and things that I was interested in. This is not a site focused on butt chafing. It's just <laughs> a happy accident. <laughs> happy accident. Hey, well, you know, if it's doing well, you know, more power to you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Shauna, it's been super fun having you on today. I've loved hearing a little bit more about your journey and getting some of your nuggets of wisdom. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing all that. Yeah, no problem. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for coming on again. Hey, everyone. Now that we've wrapped up this episode and learned about expert guidance and growing a portfolio of niche sites, I wanted to cover a common question about buying and selling online businesses. So today's question, what's an example of a bolt-on and a roll-up acquisition? So this is something we've been talking about quite a bit on, you know, cross Empire Flippers content. First, a bolt-on may look like buying a separate business to gain new synergies. Think new product lines, new customers, new geographies, intellectual property. The point is to acquire a business that has something your business doesn't currently have. An example might be an FBA business acquiring a content business to create a traffic channel off Amazon for its products and a benefit from Amazon Associates revenue or even ad revenue. The content site now becomes a bolted on to the Amazon store, which now benefits from new sources of revenue and traffic. A roll-up can look pretty similar, but we've often seen roll-ups look a little closer to home for acquisition opportunities. Think a large content site looking for synergistic opportunities within its own niche and monetization by acquiring a few sites within its same niche and absorbing them into the larger entity site. So it could be a large pet site, for example, buying up smaller pet sites that would all then direct to the larger pet site to gain new content and additional audiences. So those are just a couple quick examples. Hope that answers your question. For everyone tuning in, that just about wraps up this week's episode. Hopefully you've gained some valuable insight on the opportunities that digital assets offer. Click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace to learn about listings currently live on our platform. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to leave a review and subscribe to this podcast for more great content that'll be released soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Opportunity Podcast. I'm looking forward to having you back next week to hear from your fellow entrepreneurs and online experts. 